Gas laws. That's going to be the topic of this lesson, and we're going to look at a variety of them in this lesson, but we're going to look at a few others in the next lesson as well. Now, in this one, we'll look at Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Avogadro's Law, the Combined Gas Law, and then finally, we'll conclude it with the Ideal Gas Law. Now, this lesson's part of my high school chemistry playlist, and I'm releasing these lessons weekly throughout the 2020-21 school year. So if you want to be informed every time I post a lesson, subscribe to the channel and click the bell notification. So we're going to take a look at some gas laws now. And so in this case, we've got Boyle's Law, Charles Law, Avogadro's Law, the Combined Gas Law, and then the Ideal Gas Law. And if you notice, I've already put the Ideal Gas Law on the board. And this is a little backwards from the normal way we present this. So it turns out these are the simplest gas laws that compare just two variables at a time. And we usually then combine what we learned from each of them all together into this Combined Gas Law, and then use that to finally come up with this Ideal Gas Law. So usually this is kind of the end goal. Well, I'm going to take it for granted that we already introduced it in the last lesson for one and that this is true, this mathematical expression is true, and it'll kind of help us look back and remember each of these. So the ideal gas law relates pressure, volume, number of moles of gas is what N is, and then the temperature, T. R is what we call the universal gas constant, it's a constant. And so there's four variables and one constant in that ideal gas law. Now it turns out each of these three guys here compared volume to one of the other three variables. Boyle compared volume to pressure, so Charles compared volume to temperature, and then Avogadro, who's famous for his number, which was a mole, 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd, conveniently compared volume to the number of moles of gas. And so it's gonna make it easy to remember on that last one. So, but if you look, if you're only gonna compare two variables from this equation, so essentially what you're saying is you wanna look at how one variable changes when the other one changes. Well, that implies that you actually gotta hold the other two variables out of the four constant. And so, if we're comparing just two variables in each of these, it also means we're holding the other two constant. I just want to make sure that's explicitly stated in each case. So for example, Mr. Boyle, one way of expressing his law is you could say that P times V equals a constant. So however, if you're going to say P times V equals a constant and relate P to V, that means you've got to hold the other two variables N and T constant. And that's what I want to explicitly say. So as long as you're holding N and T constant, yes, then P times V is going to equal a constant. And we can see why that's true, again, just by alluding back to that ideal gas law. So if N is held constant and T is held constant and R is a constant, well, then a constant times a constant times a constant is just a bigger constant. And P times V would equal that bigger constant. So that's kind of where we can see where it comes from. Now, again, Mr. Boyle didn't actually have the ideal gas law to, to work with. So had been, you know, hadn't been discovered yet. So, so he kind of had the first kind of uh, piece of the puzzle, if you will. So another way to express this is you could say that P1V1 equals P2V2. So if pressure times volume is a constant, well then it's gonna equal the same constant under one set of conditions and under a second set of conditions. And so then therefore they have to, if these both equal the same constant, then they're equal to each other. And hence that's another way to express Boyle's law. And finally, one other way to express this, is you could say that pressure is proportional to one over volume. And if you're proportional to one over something, you could also say pressure is inversely proportional to volume. And that means as pressure goes up, volume goes down. And we can kind of go back to the original and see that. So if you want your pressure to go up, then your volume is going to have to go down so that they multiply out to give the exact same constant. So they're inversely proportional. As one goes up, the other goes down. So next on the list is Mr. Charles. And Mr. Charles compared volume to temperature. So... And what he said here, so is that volume over temperature equals a constant. That's one of the ways we can express Charles' law. But again, if you're comparing volume to temperature and you just want to see how volume varies with temperature only, well, then you got to hold the other variables constant. So this is only true as long as you have a constant pressure and a constant number of moles of gas. So if these are constant, then Charles' law is true. That's kind of the way that works. Now, if this ratio is equal to a constant, you can kind of see where that would be. We could divide this by temperature and then move the pressure over and you'd have volume over temperature equals NR over P and N would be held constant, P would be held constant, R is a constant. And for the same reason, therefore, V over T would equal a constant. You could also express this by saying V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, similar fashion to what we did over here. If this ratio is equal to a constant, well, then it's going to equal that same constant under one set of conditions and a second set of conditions, and therefore these ratios must equal each other. And finally, you could say 
that volume is proportional to temperature. That's the last way you could say this. And at a, a molecular level, it turns out, so again, we know that gas molecules move faster as the temperature goes up. And as they move faster, they spread out, leading to a larger volume. So that's kind of where that comes from at a molecular level. All right, so finally we're left with Mr. Avogadro, and Avogadro compared volume to number of moles of gas, and he said that the ratio of V over N equals a constant. But again, if you're going to compare V to N and want to see how volume varies with the number of moles of gas only, then you have to hold all the other variables constant. So once again, the other two variables are held constant, which in this case is pressure and then temperature as well. Just like with the other two, we have three ways to express this. So we could also say that V1 over N1 equals V2 over N2. So under one or other of a set of conditions, they equal the same constant, so they're equal to each other. And then finally, you could say that volume is proportional to the number of moles of gas. More moles of gas, greater volume. Cool. Now, you know, I'm not going to give these guys quite enough credit because these are actually more profound than I'm going to give them credit for. So, but it's a nice, lovely, convenient way to remember this here. So I like to think of that Mr. Boyle and Mr. Avogadro were at a kid's birthday party back a couple centuries ago. So in that this kid's birthday party, Mr. Avogadro finds a balloon. And he looks at that balloon and... And he says, Eureka, Eureka, did you see this? Did you see this? As I put more moles of gas in the balloon, it got bigger. More moles of gas, larger volume. Eureka, I'm a genius. Put my name on it. Call it Avogadro's Law. Well, way to go, Sherlock. And not to be undone, Mr. Boyle here wanted to get on the action, so he took that same balloon and put his mouth on it, apparently. He just blew it up. And he's still like, yeah, Mr. Avog Mr. Avogadro, you are a genius. Look at that. Look at that. So, but then he tied off this same balloon. Let's get that tied off. So, once he got that balloon tied off, he started playing with it. And he started squeezing it, and squeezing it, and squeezing it. Woo! Eureka, I'm a genius too! My name is Boyle. As the volume of the balloon got smaller, the pressure got larger. They're inversely related. And to the point where it got to such a great pressure that it popped. Eureka, I'm a genius. My name is Mr. Boyle. Put my name. Cool, way to go, Sherlock. So, cool, like I said, their, their contribution to this is actually a little more complex than just this, I'm making it out to be. So, however, I think that it used to be easier to get your name on a law. So, Mr. Charles, I finally give a little more credit to, and I kind of view Mr. Charles, as, he wasn't at this birthday party, I kind of view him as a, uh, on a hot air balloon, and if he's on this hot air balloon and he sees these power lines off in the distance, and yeah, there were no power lines a couple centuries ago, but he sees power lines off in the distance, what should he do? So, and don't say jump. So he pulls the jet. And why does he pull the jet? Well, he pulls the jet to heat up the air inside the balloon. And why does he do that? Because it causes that air to expand. So because volume and temperature are directly proportional. And as the air in that, in that balloon expands, that actually lowers its density. You might recall that density is equal to mass over volume. And so as that volume gets bigger, the density of the gas inside the balloon gets smaller. And so all of a sudden, the air inside the balloon has a lower density than the air around the balloon. And when you have a lower density, you rise to the surface. Same reason why, like, if you take a ping pong ball and hold it under the surface of the water, well, it has a lower density than water. And if you let it go, it rises to the surface. Cool. So that's kind of the credit I give Mr. Charles here. So volume is directly proportional to temperature. Now, it turns out if you take all of these at the same time and you want to compare all the variables, we can do that. So in one way we can do it is what we call the combined gas law. And it's P1V1 over T1 equals P2V2 over T2. So, but notice... If you're going to use this combined gas law, what variable do you have to hold constant? Well, you'd have to hold the number of moles of gas constant. And so, but this is the typical combined gas law. And notice it's not hard to hold the number of moles of gas constant. It just means you're using a set sample of a gas. You're not adding any more gas or taking any out. You're just using a set sample of a gas, which is easy enough to regulate. However, what if you get a question and you're doing a calculation where you actually are adding or removing gas? Well, then you need a little more than this. And what we're going to do is add that little more in, N1, 
and N2 right there. And I like to call this the better combined gas law. If you see, that's how I kind of delineated it and uh, marked it up on your study guide. So this is your better combined gas law. Now you can factor in any change, even a change in the number of moles of gas. And if you kind of look at where this comes from, so PV over NT, if you look back PV and then divide by N, divide by T, it's equal to R. So P1, V1 over N1, T1 would equal R. And P2, V2 over N2, T2 would equal R. And if they're both equal to R, then they're equal to each other. Cool. So the calculations you are likely to do, you could do a calculation with just Boyle's Law or just Charles' Law or just Avogadro's Law, but all three of these laws are combined into this combined gas law. And so the truth is any kind of calculation you're likely to see can really be handled by one of two equations, either this better combined gas law or with the ideal gas law. And we're gonna look at a couple examples. All right, so before we do a couple calculations, a couple things. So there's really two major equations at which you might be approached with a calculation here. And so a lot of students just don't realize, well, when do I use this equation versus this one? And that's what we're gonna spell out. So, but one of the things we gotta talk about is that universal gas constant R. And uh, if you took an advanced chemistry class in college, you might find out that actually we express R often in like, you know, a dozen different sets of units. It's really annoying. So the truth is it's actually really helpful because then you don't have to like change your units to match the R. Well, we're not gonna do that to you in high school. So typically there's two different values of R you might see somewhere along the way in your class. So there's this 1.08206 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin that we'll be using in this chapter. And notice the liter atmospheres, liters for volume, atmospheres for pressure. So, and then per mole and per Kelvin there. So this other one here, R equals 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. This one's actually expressed in SI units. So I noticed the joule here is the SI unit for energy. And you'll see this one used more commonly in the context of like thermochemistry. So things involving energy. And so uh, that's kind of the delineation. So in this chapter, we're, we're gonna almost exclusively use this top one here, but in future chapter, we might see this one rearing its ugly head. And definitely if you get to a college course, you'll see both of these, but you gotta kind of know which one to use. And, uh, but again, in this chapter, we're only gonna be using that first one since we're dealing with gases, which have volume in liters and pressure in atmospheres. All right. so. If we look here, so first question on your handout there says if you've got a two moles of helium gas with a pressure of 0.5 atmospheres and a temperature of 273 Kelvin, what is its volume? And so this is a classic example of when you use the ideal gas law. And we said the ideal gas law is one constant and four variables. Well, if I want you to solve for one of those variables, I have to provide you with the other three, which is exactly what we've done right here. And so in this case, we've got PV equals NRT. You might hear people say, don't be a piv nerd. So, or don't be such a piv nerd or something along those lines. So uh, in this case, we'll solve for V equals NRT over P. And so in this case, we've got two moles of a gas. So R is that 0 0.08206 liter atmospheres per mole per Kelvin, if you will, and then temperature. Now, if you look, because we're using this value of the universal constant, it determines all the other units, but this is, we're gonna have the moles cancel right here. And notice when I put the temperature in, it's gonna have to be, have to have to have to be in Kelvin. In fact, you're gonna, if you use Kelvin everywhere in this chapter, you'll always get the answer right. But there are some places where you have to use Kelvin and this is one of them. You have to, have to, have to use Kelvin. It's kind of alluded to in that first lesson. So in this case, we'll use the 273 Kelvin there. It was provided, life is good. And then we'll divide it by the pressure. So now we've got that Kelvin to cancel. And notice we need that atmospheres to ca cancel now. And so uh, the units for R here dictate what all the other units in this equation have to be. And so we need a pressure in atmospheres. Well, it was given in atmospheres. And lo and behold, this answer is gonna come out in liters. So if you had to plug a volume into this equation, you'd make sure to plug it in in liters because of that universal gas constant being expressed in units of liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. So if we work this out, this comes out to 89.6 liters. All right. We can definitely make this harder. And the way we make it harder is we just don't give this to you in convenient units. So instead of giving you the number of moles right off the bat, I could give you the number of grams instead. And then you'd have to convert it to moles. I 
give you a pressure, not in atmospheres, but I could give it to you in tor, and you'd have to convert it to atmospheres before we plug it in the equation. So, and then finally, I could give you a temperature, not in Kelvin, I could give it to you in Celsius, and you'd have to convert it to Kelvin before plugging into the equation. So, well, what's nice here, it turns out that eight grams of helium, well, the molar mass is four grams per mole, and if you convert it to moles, you're gonna get two moles. So, and it turns out if 760 equals, 760 tor equals one atmosphere, well, then if you work it out, 380 tor does equal 0.5 atmospheres, and zero degrees Celsius is 273 Kelvin. And so, to make these kind of questions harder with ideal gas calculations, they just gonna give you, that will provide you with the data that you need, just not in the most convenient units, and you'll have to do some conversions before plugging them in. Okay, so that's the ideal gas law. So when might you have to use the combined gas law instead? Well, if you noticed, for, to use the combined gas law, you actually need part of two sets of conditions. With the ideal gas law, you just need one set of conditions with one variable missing. So out of the four variables, you need to be missing one. But with the combined gas law, you need parts of two sets of conditions. And so notice the last question on the page there, a sample of gas behaving ideally has a volume of 20 liters. I'm gonna call that V1 as we'll see. So a volume of 20 liters, a pressure of one atmosphere, and a temperature of 10 degrees Celsius. And then the question says, if the pressure is increased to five atmospheres, so we got a, an initial pressure of one atmosphere, but it's increased to five atmospheres. So we've now got parts of two sets of conditions. It also says that the temperature is increased to 20 degrees Celsius. And the question then is, what is the new volume? So, well, that new volume is V2. Now notice they don't ever tell us anything about the number of moles of gas, but this is for a set sample of a gas, which means that number of moles is not changing. Well, if we go back to our combined gas law, which has these two sets of conditions, if anything in this equation is not changing, just cross it out. So in this case, N1 and N2, they're equal. Initial number of moles of gas, final number of moles of gas, they're equal. And we'll just cancel that out. Notice if the temperature wasn't changing, well then T1 would equal T2 and we canceled that out as well. And notice if we canceled both of those out, notice you'd just be left with P1V1 equals P2V2, which was Boyle's law, which says if you have N and T held constant, then P1V1 equals P2V2. So all those other little individual laws are summed up and contained within this better combined gas law here. So, but in this case, N1 does equal N2 and we'll just eliminate it right out of the equation. And so in this case, we could just start doing some plugging and chugging here. And in this case, your P1 is one atmosphere. Your V1 was 20 liters. Your T1, we're gonna come back to in just a second. Your P2 is five atmospheres. Your V2 is what we're solving for. And here's where we gotta be careful. So it turns out pressure and volume, no matter what units you use, they have a true zero, like z where you have zero volume and zero pressure. But again, the temperature is where you gotta be careful because the only true zero temperature scale is that Kelvin scale. And so in this case, it turns out pressure and volume, I don't care what units you use, as, as long as you use the same units on both sides, it'll cancel. So if you had you know, pressures in tor, you could plug the both tor right in. You wouldn't have to actually convert to atmospheres first. But for temperature, you have to, have to, have to convert it to Kelvin. So a lot of students will see a problem like this, and instead of actually doing the calculation, they'll just reason it out in their head, which I personally like, but don't make the one mistake. So if you look at this, and we say, okay, the pressure went from one atmosphere to five atmospheres, that means it increased by what factor? Well, it increased by a factor of five. Well, how are pressure and volume related? Well, they're inversely related. So if your pressure goes up by a factor of five, that means your volume will go down by a factor of five. Well, if that was the only change, well, 20 liters going down by a factor of five, which means divided by five, it'd go down to four liters. Well, it's not the only change because we're also changing the temperature from 10 degrees Celsius to 20 degrees Celsius. And they get a lot of students who mistakenly look at this and be like, oh, we doubled the temperature. And since volume and temperature are directly proportional, doubling the temperature doubles the volume. And so, so we already factored in the pressure change and got us from 20 liters down to four liters. But now since we're doubling the temperature, that'll get it up to eight liters, doubling it. And that's the problem is that we're not really going and doubling the temperature because we're going from 283 Kelvin to 293 Kelvin. And on the Kelvin scale, that doesn't look anything close to doubling. In fact, that's not even a 5% increase. It's a super small increase. And so it, it actually is going to have very little impact on changing the volume. So we'll factor 
people use a calculator to do it, but the truth is it's not going to affect it much. And so the truth is if we only factor in the pressure increase by a factor of five, that'll take the volume down by a factor of five, taking it down to four liters. And since the temperature goes up just a teeny tiny bit, that means the volume is going to go up just a teeny tiny bit and be somewhere just over four liters as we'll see. So but let's go back and plug these in then. So our initial temperature was the 283 Kelvin. Final temperature was 293 Kelvin. And now we're ready to do some algebra here. So in this case, we'll do one times 20 divided by 283 times 293 divided by five. And we're gonna get 4.14 liters. I'll round that to 4.1 liters. So, and like we said, you know, if you factor in just the pressure increase by factor five, the volume decreases by factor five down to four liters. And the fact that the temperature goes up just a teeny tiny bit caused our volume to go up just a little tiny bit above four liters. Cool. So that's your difference between your ideal gas law calculation versus your better combined gas law calculation. Ideal gas law, there's four variables in the ideal gas law. If I give you three, you calculate the fourth. For the better combined gas law, I've got to give you parts of two sets of conditions, and that's when you know it would be applicable.